Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another webinar from Data Platform Geeks. My name is Satya Ramesh and I will be the host for today's webinar. And today's webinar is on analytics at scale with uh, Azure Synapse Analytics and Power BI. And uh, our speaker is Dave. He's with us right now. And before we start the webinar, I'll just take a few minutes to quickly introduce about what is Data Platform Geeks. And I also talk about a flagship venture from Data Platform Geeks, which is Data Platform Summit. So our community, community work started back in 2004, and we started with seven people back in Calcutta. If you see, that is the first picture of our first community, community event. And from there, we have done a lot of community work in the last two decades. And in the year 2010, our community work shaped out and uh, we started SQL Server Geeks. And gradually, we started in the year 2015. We have started SQL Server Geeks Annual Summit 2015. And that progressed for a couple of years, 2016. And we have rebranded ourselves and Data Platform Geeks was born. And from 2017 onwards, the SQL Server Geeks Annual Summit was renamed as Data Platform Summit. And from that time onwards till 2019, it was all in person. And from 2020 onwards, everything was virtual due to the pandemic. And if you can see, we have a lot of community events. We do a lot of conferences. You can find everything in Data Platform Geeks. We do a lot of virtual symposiums, webinars, in-person events, etc. And this was one of our pictures that we really cherished. This was the uh, Data Platform Summit 2019 group picture that we have taken in Bangalore with along with a lot of Microsoft people and a lot of experts from industry and our delegates, etc. You can see uh, Gail Shepard, she was corporate vice president of Azure Data at that moment. And from this picture to this picture, we have grown shoulder to shoulder and we expanded ourselves to a lot of countries. So if you can look at this map, a lot of people started flowing, uh, started flying down to Bangalore and started used to start attending Data Platform Summit and after that, when after that, once we went virtual, then a lot of countries started participating. So these are the top 20 countries that used to participate in Data Platform Summit. So this year, we have already launched Data Platform Virtual Summit 2022. And the good news is this is free. This year, Data Platform Summit is free for everyone. You just go to dataplatformvirtualsummit.com and you can register for free. And we have also announced pre-conference trainings. So pre-conference are will happen one week before the actual conference. And these are the paid trainings. And we have announced total 12 classes. These are the eight classes. And Dave is doing one of them. And we have recently announced four new pre-con trainings as well, which you can find in our website. And Dave is doing analytics at scale with Power BI and Azure Synapse Analytics pre-con with us. And the special thing about Data Platform Summit is the price is very, very nominal and you get to have recordings of the training as well. Nowhere in the world you get the recordings of the training class that you have attended. And the special things about Data Platform Summit that we are trying this year is we are doing multiple editions. So Data Platform Virtual Summit, the regular conference will happen in five editions. ANZ edition, APAC edition, India edition, EMEA edition, and America's edition. And to increase our diversity efforts, we have also trying to bring you the content in multiple languages. So in Data Platform Virtual Summit 2022, you will see the content in Spanish, German, Portuguese, Serbian, Slovenian, Mandarin, etc., etc. So we try to bring the diversity factor into Data Platform Virtual Summit this year. And we also have a special, a special focus on SQL Server 2022. It is already under public preview. Maybe it will go, it will be released this year. Maybe we never know, but it's already under public preview. We have a special track on SQL Server 2022. And yes, we believe that content is king and we strive to give you the best possible content that you can grab when you attend Data Platform Virtual Summit 2022. And a lot of technology coverage. Uh, database administration, database development, business intelligence analytics, data science, industry solutions, and special student track this year. And a lot of technology coverage is being uh, covered under Data Platform Virtual Summit 2022. 
and we also invite knowledge partners if you wish to be knowledge partners about for data platform virtual summit yes you're all invited please write to kp at data platform geeks.com you can visit data platform virtual summit.com also to find more details about knowledge partnership you can right now you're all know about data platform virtual summit and you can quickly evaluate go to the website and the bookings are open you can join the summit for free and you can purchase training classes and uh, whoever is attending this training class this webinar today you have a special discount code that we will that will be shared in the chat window in some time special thanks to microsoft so supporting our community efforts sql server geeks data platform summit and data platform geeks and we request you to follow us in all of our channels we are everywhere we are on youtube telegram twitter linkedin facebook etc and quick housekeeping announcement we all know that please uh, use headphones for the better experience and if you have any question please use q and a panel to ask your questions and uh, important thing is please stick around till the end of the webinar and please share the feedback with us and that's all friends with this i'll hand it over to dave Dave, please take over. Thank you very much. So let me share my screen. Screen number three, share. Yes, I can see the screen. Please go ahead. All right. So um, the chat uh, is now uh, gone on my side. So um, Satya, please help me. Uh, in, uh, in in that aspect, um, sure, if there is sure. something, um, any questions comes in the chat or any questions comes in Q and A panel, I'll help you. There. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I um, uh, I don't expect any uh, things uh, like halfway the session uh, that that's really urgent. Um, but if there are, just feel free to interrupt me, and uh, then uh, we handle them uh, right on the spot. And um, otherwise, um, yeah. Um, Post your questions, please, in the in the chat, and uh, we will get to them uh, at the end of the of the webinar. Um, so we were, we are going to talk about Power BI and Azure Synapse Analytics, and um, I have uh, uh, a lot of experience in both areas. But usually, I create these solutions uh, with uh, my buddy Mark Mark Lelyfeld, <clears throat> but he's not here uh, today, and. Um, uh, as you said, in the um, uh, in the future, we will have the precon at the uh, summit, and uh, probably Mark will join me there to to do the session together. So you get um, two experts for the price of one. So um, a little bit about uh, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Dave Reiter. I live in the Netherlands, and I'm a solution architect for uh, yeah the data analytics world. I have um, around 15 years experience and um, quite some time uh, I've worked with Moko, a consultancy firm in the Netherlands where uh, Mark is also working. And uh, a year ago, I started my own firm called Blue Rocker Data Consulting. Um, uh, if you want to know more about that, just yeah, uh, check it out on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter as well. And I have a blog on moderndata.ai. Um, yeah, usually my friend introduces himself, so I'll do it for him. Um, he's also a consultant in data analytics, but uh, more of a Power BI expert uh, than, than, than I am. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to know more about him, go to data-mark.com. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, this is a little agenda. Uh, I don't know if we cover everything in depth because um, yeah, we have so so little time. So I'll do my best to, to cherry pick and uh, get you the the essence of yeah the um, the topic. Um, but please know that anything will be talked about in in um, uh, yeah in depth and um, with a lot of room for for questions and to to focus on your situation during that precon training. Um, so, uh, if you, if you think, Hey, this is interesting. Um, I want to know more. That's when you think you, um, uh, you really need to, uh, register for that pre-con. All right. So, uh, we will talk about the challenges that, that you can face in the data platform specifically, 
Azure Synapse Analytics, and the challenges that you can have in Power BI. And um, how, at least Mark and I noticed that the, um, uh, the, the, the other side of the things so uh, can help um, each other. So you can combine uh, essentially the best of both worlds to get an integrated end-to-end -end solution uh, that, uh, that, that, yeah, that, that's scaling a lot better than the individual uh, solutions. So um, that, that's the key focus of this, uh, of this training. And um, when we have talked about those challenges, we will see how we can solve them with a little deep dive in the data platform solution areas and advanced scenarios that you can do there and the Power BI advanced things, features that you can uh, utilize. Um, for instance, some hybrid tables, uh, incremental refresh, and um, how you can also orchestrate uh, the entire data flow from source ingestion towards a refreshed data set in Power BI. All right, so after the, the end uh, goal, the, the pre-con training, you will be able to design that solution targeted to your situation, of course, um, using uh, yeah, you know, all of these advanced capabilities from, from left to right. Um, and as I said, the orchestration is an important part. You, you don't scale your solution if you don't have the orchestration um, up and ready. You cannot have a 15 minute refresh from source data towards a report in a, in a giant uh, big data uh, solution if you don't have the orchestration uh, up to par. And as I said, 15 minutes refresh, easily uh, capable if you have the performance right. Um, so we will explore techniques, how you can identify the bottlenecks of your performance, how you can troubleshoot them, and in the end, of course, um, how, to, how to solve them. Um, and along the way, there is a focus on cost management because having a scalable solution that just uh, where the cost just scales up as well, that's not really a, an ideal situation, is it, right? So um, yeah, we always wanna keep the cost predictable and as low as possible and not uh, yeah, co connected uh, linearly to, to how, your, uh, how your data size uh, grows. You, you wanna keep maybe the same cost um, when, uh, when your data platform grows and your solution grows. So some tips and tricks, how you can do that, uh, but it's not a separate chapter. It will just uh, be mentioned along the way because it's an integral part of all of the decisions that we make. All right. <clears throat> so what kind of um, solution challenges do we face? Why, why is it interesting to talk uh, like a, a pre-con training eight hours long about this uh, topic? And um, that originates from the, um, the, the separation of worlds that, that we see in day-to-day in -day life. Um, and it was also reflected in how Mark and I did our uh, jobs. Um, uh, so so we, we were colleagues and a lot of times a solution that we built <clears throat> if it was like, it took our both, both our expertises to, to finish and to, to finish successfully and to succeed. The, um, uh, I'm more of a data platform um, uh, guy. And uh, what we noticed is that the data platform people kind of always did Power BI on the side because the data platform without this reporting analytics layer in Power BI, it's not that useful. There's actually always Power BI involved. But the Power BI consultants and developers, they could do without the data platform. And th th that's like fine. There's, there, there are perfect use cases where you don't need a data platform, but um, there are yeah, um, challenges that you can face in Power BI where a data platform actually solves that really easily. So um, they should just combine those, those expertises and then you get an integrated um, yeah, solution. And uh, yeah, so it's all about um, bridging that, that gap. So let's take a look at the data platform solution challenges that I uh, would face. Um, I would have a, a really great data platform. Ingestion of data uh, was, was uh, streaming. Um, um, you know, I get real-time data, uh, a lot of data. I didn't care about the size of the data. I would just do incremental refreshing. 
uh, getting the delta load from the source. But then in Power BI, I would do an import and it would be so much data. And without carefully constructing the data set, it couldn't handle the, the volume of data. And that was a problem, of course. Um, I could have you know, minute refreshes data uh, in, in my data platform, but then probably I couldn't, couldn't reflect that. So um, that, that's pretty useless. And a lot of times this would happen, maybe not every time the, the, the data was too big, but some of those challenges, I hope you, you can recognize that, that there's, uh, there's always this area of, hmm, this table takes too long, or uh, the, the size of this, this table is just big, the, the refresh works okay within my time frame, but you know, it's not effective to develop it further. And um, there can be a lot of those, those areas, those, those type of challenges. And for me as well, what I noticed was, um, how do I get that near real-time data in Power BI? Always was a question. Um, and we will get to possible solution, um, solution options for, for that. But um, I can tell you direct query is not the answer to that. Uh, having a full model in direct query uh, might technically solve these two challenges, but it will not perform. It will have um, poor end user uh, experience and, and uh, role of security is, is, is uh, also um, diff more difficult to implement. And um, yeah, so how do you then do that? Um, as an example of what I can face and encounter is um, in Power BI Desktop, I would load all of the data on my laptop. It work, would work fine, but then um, it's in memory. And when I try to save my document, um, it would just give me after a couple hours of trying to save this, this error message. So Power BI Desktop ran out of memory trying to save the model to disk. So um, that, that, that's, that it just doesn't work. Um, how about direct query? Well, um, it has its limitations. Power Query, uh, in if you have direct query as your data set cache option, then um, Power Query has its limitations. And direct query is not exactly the same as, as streaming data. Uh, the front end still caches data, so keep that in mind. And you, you miss a lot of these features. You don't have the built-in data hierarchy. Uh, it doesn't just doesn't work. Um, Talking about DAX, uh, it has also a lot of limitations. Uh, basically, only the simple calculations are possible. And yeah, that, that's pretty limited, limiting, right? Um, slow end user performance might be the most important limitation. If you have a report and when you open it, it has to load eight seconds. Do you think that's acceptable? Sounds really short, eight seconds, but just time it, try to count. It's too long. When you open up a web page and you expect data, a couple seconds is the, is, the, is the maximum it should take to load. And then you need to interact to be able to interact with it. And Direct Query usually doesn't give you that, um, um, yeah, that, that experience. Um, maybe if you scale up the backend hugely and spend a lot of money on a powerful backend cluster, uh, yes, then. Um, you, you can get a better experience, but that's not what we want, right? We, we don't want to spend tens of thousands of euros uh, every month for, for the backend. Um, if you do have Direct Query, consider this, um, um, this trick. <clears throat> uh, and we will, we will just talk during this, this pre-con training about these, these tricks. And maybe you know half of them or, or all of them, then you're pretty expert on the field. Uh, but, but one of those tricks might save your day and uh, get that solution up and running uh, and, and uh, you know, un unblock you uh, in your solution. So this is one of them. If you have uh, a direct query need, consider um, this, this option where you uh, reduce the number of queries a lot by having this apply button on the screen. So users can just click apply when they have their selections of filters ready and, and only then the data at the backend will be retrieved and showed to the end user. If you don't do it like this, many queries will be sent to the backend for every click that the user does to change a filter. And yeah, usually 
um, when a when a user experiences or interacts with a report, they have more than one filter that they want to set. They they are they they think okay this 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 this. So um, you just wait until they're done. Then they click on apply, and then the data refreshes. Okay. Um, then about the topic of near real time data, um, a refresh just takes too long. If you have a big Power BI data set, uh, it can take an half an hour to to refresh. Yeah, that's not that's not uncommon. But if you need near real time data, that might be too long. So um, what other options do you have? Streaming data sets, well, they actually only allow one table in your model um, to be streaming at once. The scope is one table. So um, th that's limiting. That's not what you, what you uh, the power of Power BI is so, so much greater. So um, streaming data sets are not the answer. Um, I don't really use them uh, in, in the field. Um, and um, keep in mind that maybe not all your queries are foldable yet. You can make them work, make them foldable if you um, if that's possible. We, we, I, I will teach you how to do that. Um, and incremental refresh depends on uh, foldable queries. So um, yeah, that's an important thing to know when you want to show near real time data in Power BI. It might be blocking you from doing that. And then uh, your knowledge, and remember, this is me as a data platform guy with limited Power BI experience. Um, actually, I know more about Power BI than the usual data platform engineer. But you know, if they, they're an expert in Python and getting that ETL working, they are not the expert as well in Power BI. So they don't know about foldable queries and incremental refresh policies. That's that, that's an uh, an advanced feature that not, not they might not even know about it, and then struggle to implement if they found out about that option. So how do we solve these challenges? We use Power BI in a good way. So we optimize the model. We use aggregations where possible. We might even use a hybrid table, and it's not mentioned here, but incremental refresh, and we combine. Uh, the data platform refresh with the Power BI refresh to get the end-to-end -end orchestration. All right, skipping to the Power BI solution challenges. So switch, switch the hat. We're now a Power BI developer. And uh, what, what solution challenges do we face? Well, first of all, um, <clears throat> we might be loading data from a lot of various sources, and they can be quite challenging. Um, flat files huge, big chunks of files, APIs. Um, if you're lucky, the, the authentication to the API is um, you know, not, not OAuth. Um, OAuth authentication is yeah more difficult to implement in Power BI. Uh, it is secure, though. So um, that's why you, you encounter it more and more and more. Um, but that's difficult to do in Power BI. Um, some sources are manually maintained. Um, <clears throat> so where do you do that? You, you have your Power BI scope, remember? Do you, um, do, do you create a central location where people manage that data? Sounds like a data platform. Um, and also um, some data is decentralized, um, like it's all over the place. So are you going to connect to all of those locations from your single Power BI solution? You could use data flows in, in the Power BI service to do that, to load them once and then reuse that data in multiple Power BI solutions. That's a big step in a good direction. But remember, this also sounds like an intermediate layer, a data platform layer. So yeah, you, you need other things outside of the purely Power BI data set to get that solved in a, a really good way. And the, and the last item that is worth mentioning is um, Power BI struggles in storing historical data. So if your data source does not serve you historical versions of the data, Power BI cannot uh, cache them for you. Power BI, remember, is sort of a truncate refresh, like a full refresh. That's the default of Power BI. And that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, but, but you cannot say, OK, give me the data of today. And I will keep the data of yesterday in my in my system, and I stack it. 
Um, that's that's something that's really difficult to design in Power BI. There are some some tricks for that, but um, they're not really manageable. So um, I hope you, you can relate to at least one of these solution challenges, or you have some similar ones um, in your in your head. Um, a lot of these will be solved using a data platform. Synapse Analytics can ingest data from various types of sources. APIs are no problem at all. And historical data is a piece of cake in uh, a data platform. You can use a really common uh, architecture called Data Lakehouse and store, store data uh, yeah, uh, historically. So let's talk about how Power BI and Synapse Analytics can be better together. First, we um, uh, check out the uh, data platform solution. Um, and, and remember, I'm, I'm going a bit fast, but that's, yeah, otherwise we, we won't reach the, the end of this uh, talk. Um, if you think, hey, okay, uh, hold on, then, uh, yeah, you're welcome to join in the uh, session in September where we have four hours a day, two days, where um, we will talk about these in-depth with demos. You can ask questions uh, whenever you think, hey, how would you do this? Then uh, we have time to, to tackle that. Um, so Azure Systems Analytics, uh, it's a suite of tools. You can do the traditional data warehousing where you have a SQL database, where you get the data in there, you do store procedures and functions to um, transform your data. But there's also a really um, uh, powerful Spark platform in, inside an engine, and you can do uh, data lake house architecture in there as well. And one really cool feature is that you can use many languages to uh, transform your data. And you can pick and, and, and mix those languages whenever you see fit. So if you have an existing solution and it's, it's leveraging SQL, SQL language, then uh, you can just migrate it and it will, it will, yeah, no, it will work quite easily. Uh, but these days, a lot of development work, data engineering work is done with Python. So the new things uh, and, and like one fact table might be a combination of SQL and some Python code. That's no problem at all. And um, if you think, well, okay, I, I haven't worked with Azure Synapse Analytics, but I do have some experience with Azure Data Factory, then please note that Data Factory is also available in, in the suite of Azure Synapse Analytics. It is a sort of combination of all of those powerful tools inside one, um, one portal. Um, so let's see what kind of options we have to ingest data from APIs. Remember, that's one of the topics that in, in Power BI, it's quite difficult. Uh, how would you do that in Azure Systems Analytics? Uh, there are many options. Um, some of them are not as yeah, um, good to pick. So uh, I'll briefly discuss them. Um, the first one is a pipeline, which originates from the Azure Data Factory um, product. And um, there are activities in a pipeline where you can uh, retrieve data and then store it in your data lake. The pipeline functionality is not intended to be a data transformation feature, but it can be a copy, copy activity, copy feature. So getting data from an a from a uh, API is really well implemented in a pipeline. So I would advise to do that. Um, you could also use a data flow, which is also originating from the data factory product. And don't confuse that with data flows in Power BI. Uh, the data flow functionality in data factory is an, uh, under the hood, it executes Spark code and uh, it's really powerful. And it's, um, it's resembling the SSIS world. If you, if you have used SQL Server integration services and before, then data flow um, uh, is sort of the same look and feel. You have blocks, you create this data flow, and it's visually uh, with, with, yeah, it's, it's really visual oriented. And then you can use Spark Notebooks. And as I said, no, many languages available. 
uh, also a great choice to interact with APIs, but it's more coding. It's, it's just you create code. It's not visual at all. Um, so if that's your preference or you have, um, yeah, if that's your preference, then, then do that. And the last option, uh, wrangling data flows, uh, also originating from data factory is um, uh, Power Query, but then uh, a bit more limited. And it's, uh, I think, a feature that is not uh, as rich as uh, it can potentially be. So keep an eye out for it. And uh, if, 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 if the richness of that Wrangling Data Flows offering improves, then uh, it might very well be a, a viable option to ingest data, to, to use to ingest data. And then the, the other topic, uh, how do you store the data in a lake? Remember, this is maybe for the data engineer, uh, you know, the, what they already do. They, they know this, they're an expert in this, but I'm telling this more to the Power BI people in the room than the data engineers. Um, the data lake uh, is an approach where you have, um, well, basically one big storage. It's a really uh, big hard drive that you have. And um, if you want to keep data uh, structured and you know you want to keep track of data and don't let it become a data swamp instead of a data lake, then um, please apply, uh, apply a, uh, a layered approach. In the market, the bronze, silver, and gold um, uh, approach is, is standard, um, one of the standards. So um, uh, yeah, that's a really good one to do. And um, I'll tell a bit more about what those layers um, are about. Um, the, the bronze layer is about your raw data. And you just copy over whatever you load from your source. If the source is a file, like an Excel file, you will have that Excel file in your bronze layer in the correct folders. So you, you would have a structure where you, um, where you store within bronze, you have a subfolder for every system that you load. And within that system, you would have a folder for every table. And then within the table, you would have a, a folder for the uh, date and time when you loaded that specific data. So if, if it's an Excel file, then in a folder for the date and time would be that Excel file. Um, if it's an API and you get data in JSON format, store the JSON right there. And then the second layer would be the silver layer. And that's where you apply metadata. You structure it more, you, you refine it. Basically you sort of conform it to the same format. Um, and also, you know, business business talking. So the dates are all formatted in the same way. Um, if you have um, a client uh, system, you might already integrate and, and say, okay, I I uh, uh, make sure that it's all written in the same um, uh, format uh, for, for my client codes. And uh, really important, you have the standard file format. And the um, yeah, one of the most used file formats these days is the Delta Lake, uh, the Delta format, which is an enriched um, parquet format. And in the silver layer, all of your data is in that file format. No longer you have JSONs or Excels. It's all parquet plus plus, you know, with the Delta sugaring on top. And then in the gold layer, you would be disconnected from the source system world, you would focus on the front end, on, on how am I going to use this data? So you make it fit for purpose. If it's the Power BI model that you're uh, going to need this data in, you know you're, you're building a star schema. So create a table for every table in your data set. It's just prepare it as much as possible in the format that you need it in Power BI. And of course, implement all your business rules, transformations, merges, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Also, the data in gold will be stored in Delta. All right. So I will skip the demo now, right now. But if you want, uh, yeah, visit the precon. Um, I'll go back just one second um, because I forgot to mention here in this diagram you can see. 
that there is a SQL serverless views layer right here between Power BI and your Data Lake Gold layer. And um, that's the nice thing about uh, having Synapse Analytics is that you have this serverless views option. And serverless um, is a, a common term in, in the data landscape, but for Power BI people, it might be um, uh, not, you know, not, not, mm, not known. And uh, what this means is that you don't have a dedicated SQL Server database waiting for you to, to serve your, the queries for you. Uh, and you, in that case, you would, you would pay for that database. Uh, you can scale it up and down, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a predictable cost, steady cost. If you want to scale up, you have to do it manually. Serverless means that Microsoft will take care of the, the, the hardware and the infrastructure and, and the databases for you in the backend. You have a sort of a virtual layer and you define your queries in there, your views in there. And whenever you say, hey, I, I do a select star from that view, it will warm up the, the, the server in the backend. That, that's, that's really uh, like instantly. It takes a couple of seconds uh, uh, the, the first time uh, and then uh, after that, you don't even notice that there's a, there's a delay because it's already there. And um, this is a really cost efficient way because you pay for the amount of data that will be scanned by your query. So if you have um, uh, not, you know, if, yeah. even if you would load that data in the SQL server, uh, you would pay a lot and a lot more. Um, so this is my go-to to get data from the lake and, and the lake is, remember that the giant big storage account uh, and Power BI struggles to get the data from the lake uh, directly. It can do that, uh, but it, it's so much easier to work with this uh, SQL Server endpoint uh, than, uh, than doing it directly. So keep that in mind. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is a short warm up time. Um, here you have an example of uh, some demo that I prepared with a lot of data, 1 billion plus data, or is it, it's even more. This, this is uh, 114 billion records in Southwest Territory alone. So um, that data was uh, scanned and served to me in 14 seconds. Um, and I think this was um, when, when I did it initially. Uh, all the queries after this were a couple seconds most. Uh, so this warm-up time is something to consider. Uh, if you have a direct query plans, this, this warm-up time will you know, drastically make your uh, direct query report uh, performance a, a lot lower. But if you have a end-to-end um, -end refresh, where you say, hey, Power BI, go and refresh your imported data, 14 seconds extra duration is, of course, neglectable. Um, a lot of best practices for serverless pools about how you can optimize your storage in your data lake, keep them between 100 megabytes and 10 gigabytes per file, wherever possible. Um, and then looking at the time, uh, let's move on to the Power BI improvement areas. So now that, now that we have uh, uh, checked out what, what the Power BI people can do in Data Lake, let's do it the other way around. So we have um, the data engineer and they need to improve their Power BI solution or you know they get help from the Power BI developers. And what will the Power BI developer tell them? These are the things that we are going to take a look at if they are applicable for you. First of all, let's measure what is going on. And you can do um, the basic uh, um, uh, measurement, simple measurements, not basic, but it's, it's easy to do, I mean, uh, using something called VertiPack Analyzer. And that's built in is a tool called DAX Studio. And with a couple of clicks, you will get not only uh, this uh, top level uh, overview of the total size, but you will also get, let me double check this overview. Um, and you can see exactly where your volume is. And the biggest um, 
challenge in your data set will be the volume. Um, that, that's usually the main consideration for, for, for speeding things up. If it's the performance that you want to speed up or the refresh uh, that you want to speed up, uh, having a smaller data set will always help. And where do you where do you start? So in this example, you see sales aggregated table is uh, one of the biggest contributors. And the Vertipack analyzer will serve you this overview and you can uh, check out columns, relationships, partitions, and, and the summary that we also just saw uh, yeah, in, within seconds. So please do that. Uh, keep track of your performance improvements by storing screenshots or the, the output of this analyzer uh, so you can uh, you can see, hey, last week when I started, what was it back then? What what did I do? Did I did I improve how I think I improved? That's uh, uh, really important. And then uh, your data set will also improve if you apply a star schema. Um, there are numerous blog posts and webinars about this topic, but in in general, uh, you keep your uh, your fact data centered and you split your dimension data into uh, data tables that focus on the descriptive information only. Uh, how would you um, roll up your facts? Th those tables are the dimensions. And if this is new for you, then there's a whole world to explore. Um, and uh, yeah, sometimes we call them lookup tables on steroids. Um, then aggregations. And this is, this is something that we can spend uh, hours on. Uh, and we will, we will do um, a, a big topic on this in the, in the pre-con. Um, because aggregations are maybe easy to understand, but how you can utilize them, when you should apply them, is something you, you yeah, get your, need to get your head around. And um, when, when, it, when it clicks, then um, yeah, you can decide how you can uh, apply this to your solutions. Um, so what, what an aggregation will do, it will have an in-memory cache of a certain aggregated form of another table in your model. So let's say you already have a sales table, then you can define an aggregated table of that sales data, which is on a higher aggregated level, which means some detail is left out. Maybe the... Um, the, the, the product item that somebody bought is missed out, is left out, but the product category is still in there. So you roll up all of the data. You can no longer see it in that aggregate table by a product, product item. Um, but the result is a much smaller, in terms of size, uh, table. And what the engine will do is if you have defined such an aggregated table, it will know if it would need uh, to, uh, if, it, if it's possible to check out the cache to uh, the aggregated table in the cache to serve you that query, or if it needs to go to the detailed table. And this example is a query, uh, uh, a, a, a query option where the detailed table would be served from your uh, data source, your backend, the data data lake, for instance. And um, this way, you would get a smaller data set, uh, faster data set. And uh, there, are, yeah, there are lots of options to, to use this to optimize your, your experience. And also, in the end, this can help you to get near real-time data uh, in combination with, with uh, yeah, a big set of data. Um, I'll skip this one. Power BI is also capable of defining automatic aggregations. Uh, so you don't have to define them yourselves, but this is only possible for certain data sources. So if you get your data from an Azure SQL database, a dedicated SQL pool in Azure Synapse, Google BigQuery or Snowflake, then Power BI, if you have premium per user or premium capacity, then uh, it can check out the uh, query logs from the users and, sit, and then, then define which aggregations are um, helpful. And it would just add them to your model, make them uh, refreshed, 
And over time, it would just keep training and learning which ones are used, which ones are necessary. So that's a that's a really powerful solution. Uh, if you yeah, if this if this situation is applicable to you, then um, yeah, something worth to check out. Then uh, this is what I talked about. Uh, when a query comes in, it would check, hey, can I source it from the uh, aggregated data or uh, use the direct query uh, detailed data? And, and an aggregation does not have to be in direct query for detailed data. You can have the detailed data also imported. But if you do that, then the size of your model will not uh, be smaller. So that's why this example is here. Um, it, it, it's, it's usually the biggest improvement if you then keep the detailed data in direct query mode and the aggregated data in import mode, that's where your big win will be. Um, so incremental refreshes and hybrid tables. Um, incremental refresh means that Power BI will define some partitions of your table and then only refresh the data that is uh, new and, and, and refreshed in your backend and will only load that. So it can really optimize the um, time necessary for a data uh, table in your data set to refresh. Uh, it's supported for, for Pro, uh, Power BI Pro as well in the data sets. There's also an incremental refresh option for data flows in Power BI, but you would need Power BI Premium uh, to use that. And um, the option to create a hybrid table, uh, the second bullet talks about that, is something that you can only do in Power BI Premium, Premium user or capacity. Um, how would you create such an incremental refresh um, policy? Uh, it's something that you configure in uh, Power BI Des Desktop, and you do it on a table-by-table -table basis. And what you need is a couple of parameters called range start, range end. And by the way, this is pretty well documented in, in the Power BI Docs as well, and we will show you in a demo uh, during the pre-con where we, we just click through everything uh, as well. Um, and in your um, Power Query side of things, you would add a custom filter in your, um, your screen where you say, hey, my order date, I want to filter it to be between the range start and end parameter values that you have right here. So that's where you, where you start. And then you open up this diagram, you point to the table, and you say, hey, enable the incremental refresh, and you can just configure it. That's all you need to do. So you say, uh, I want the data uh, within five years. Older than that, I'm not interested. You can just delete it for me. And that's a rolling window. And then um, incrementally refresh X number of periods. And this can be small. So it will only check out the last three days of data. Um, and the rest is just ignored because you, you might know that there's no change at all in that data. Oh, fine, then we can just skip them. But if you know that they're in the last half year, six months, there will be uh, changes. Like most of the data is today, yesterday, last week. Some changes that are critical might be a couple months ago. Then you increase this value. Keep in mind that the duration of a single refresh would have to check for changes in all of those six months. And it is then required to to check this, this box for detecting data changes. What you would need for that uh, is something that we will cover in the pre call for the detecting data changes. But if you apply this, the refresh action for this table will be a lot uh, shorter in duration than uh, without this incremental refresh policy. And then, if you have this Power BI Premium and you are, you are capable of getting the data using direct query, then you can uh, leverage this, this, this newly added section here on the, on the corner. It says real time. And what that does 
is it will add a partition in your table for the data of today. And it will be in direct query storage mode, which means that whenever you have a visual on your report that shows the data for today, it will get that data using direct query and show it to the end user. The data that's not for today, but for last week or whatever last year, that will be just sourced from the in-memory cached data. And um, that's, a, that's a really neat uh, trick. So you, you do have the real-time data. Remember, we have a data platform that's optimized and every X minutes we have data, maybe it's streaming. So whenever a new source event is created, we just immediately let it flow through our data platform and it will be you know, within seconds in our gold table. Then if the user opens this report page and, and the table has hybrid, uh, hybrid table, then that new event will be shown to that user as well. Really nice. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we, we talked about this. Then I want to talk about the refresh as a, as a final topic. Um, what, kind of, what options do you have to refresh your Power BI data set? Uh, remember, this is, this is the data engineer that doesn't know a lot, a lot about the Power BI, and he just knows, yeah, I can schedule. That, that's fine. That's a big, big you know, easy option. Back in the day with analysis services, we didn't have a schedule. So um, that's already a big win. But it, it's no use for us if we have a requirement to get new data within 15 minutes in our um, Power BI model. How do we then um, get the data? Of course, we can manually trigger, but that's a bit expensive, right? Um, <clears throat> then the, the, there are options to use some form of API. Power Automate is a feature, like it's a, it's a, it's a brother of Power BI or a sister, and um, really uh, capable of chaining events together. So if your data refresh in the data platform is finished, you can use Power Automate to chain the refresh and kick off your data set refresh. Uh, under the hood, it uses the API to do that. You can use PowerShell scripts as well. Under the hood, it will call the API, and you can directly use the API yourself. And some considerations, um, why would you take, uh, uh, why would you do a refresh of the entire model when um, it, it just takes uh, too much time and uh, has a high constraint on your, your backend sources, your data platform? If you do a, a full refresh of your entire data model every 15 minutes, but you have 20 fact tables, you know, 10 dimensions, maybe 100 dimensions, um, I know for sure not all of the data is, is, is refreshed in the last 15 minutes. So do it more intelligent. Try to focus on what table is, been, is updated and maybe only a couple partitions within a table and see if you can use one of those techniques that we discussed earlier uh, as a hybrid table, for instance, or an incremental refresh policy. How would you do that is by using the... Uh, async refresh API, which is now called enhanced refresh API. Or if you want to uh, do it more bare metal, go for the XMLA endpoint and send it a uh, XMLA command. Uh, but the more easy thing is just using the refresh API. And you can specify the objects to refresh. Um, here you see uh, an example where you say, OK, we want a full refresh. Don't, this is not full data model. This is the type of refresh. Uh, there are other options. Check out the documentations. You can do, yeah, leave it to full if you don't know. Um, leave it to transactional and max parallelism and retry to the defaults. This is the part that, that, that you want to uh, experiment with, objects. It's just a little JSON structure of which table, maybe a partition within the table you want to refresh. And um, this, is, uh, th this is quite familiar for the data platform people. 
uh, they, they talk about partitions also in, in the, the, the Delta files. Um, so they know, hey, hmm, only these partitions have been processed in my data lake. Just call those partitions in a uh, refresh action. And the duration of that refresh will be a lot shorter, maybe a minute instead of 30 minutes. So that's, that's one of the best tricks to shorten your, um, your refresh and get uh, data in a near real-time fashion towards the end user. And as I said, the enhanced uh, refresh API is now generally available, formally called the asynchronous refresh that we just saw in the, in the slide deck. Um, then ideally you would have this daisy chain of actions where you combine the pipelines from your data platform and also do the Power BI refresh at the end. You see here a screenshot of how you can do that. So you get an AID token and then call the refresh API with that token because that's the authentication mechanism. And within this action, you would use that JSON structure that you just saw. That's all you need to do if you also want to refresh your Power BI data set intelligently within, your, um, yeah, the, within the orchestration of your data platform. If you do it like this, you will have the lowest latency between the source and the report. And as we said, incremental loading should be possible and applied, uh, should be applied where possible. You already did that in your data platform, do some delta loading, uh, from your source, you're not going to reload the source every run. No. Why would you reset, uh, reload your entire Power BI data set with every run? Do it, do it more uh, smart. All right. So I think I want to wrap it up for now. I hope you've learned already quite some tricks. And um, I'm looking forward to doing eight hours of this uh, with you in September. Any questions that I can answer right now? If you're talking, you need to unmute Satya. Let's see if I can bring the chat as well. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, looks like there is one question from Bhupendra. Is the async refresh only for premium? That's the question. Um, I think the asynchronous refresh is not only for premium. If, if you want to know 100% sure, go to the Power BI blog and check out this post from Bemi. He, he definitely will mention if it's premium, uh, if it's premium only. So um, yeah, I think it is. I think it's not premium only, um, but um, yeah, double check it, please. While we wait for more questions, I'll just provide one link for all of us, uh, all, all the attendees. So we request all of you to please click on the link and provide your feedback in LinkedIn. We have put up a post there in LinkedIn. I request all the attendees to just click on the link and put up your comments, good, bad, ugly, whatever you want to tell us, you can use that link to tell us. We wish to improve. All speakers want to hear the feedback after the sessions. So please go and do that. And if you, yeah. if you do that, uh, might be good to mention that that it was this this talk, this webinar, uh, because I understand it's a generic post, right? Also about uh, previous uh, webinars. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have specific feedback for, for my webinar uh, me, or, or my speaking, um, make sure that I understand that it's that it's focused to, to me or this webinar. Actually, it's a it's a public forum. It's on LinkedIn. People will put up a comments in LinkedIn, and we have put up a post there uh, with a thank you message regarding the series of webinars that we are doing. So I think uh, we request all, all the attendees to uh, mention Dave uh, when you are commenting about this particular session. So it's easy for us. That uh, that's, what I, that's what I meant. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. That, uh, that I, I really welcome any feedback. Yeah, thank you. So we are awaiting for a few more questions. And uh, 
while we wait, I'll just quickly share my screen. Yes, so the feedback link is there. And on one final time, I just repeat, Dave is also doing an eight hour virtual training on analytics at scale with Power BI and Azure Synapse Analytics. So it's going to be deep dive, uh, instructor led training. You'll get more information from Dave. And just for this webinar attendees, we have a special discount code called, code called uh, 60 steal it. So the discount code is already there on the screen, 60 steal it. So you'll get a 60% discount on the current price that is there on the website. So please go ahead and grab the lowest price possible at this moment. And uh, I also request Dave to speak a little bit more about his training class. So what he's going to cover in the eight hour training class that he's going to do in this September. Oh, I need to unmute. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I already mentioned a couple of items during my webinar. Um, but let me quickly, briefly uh, uh, check the outline of the training. Um, yeah, what I can, what can I say? Uh, after the the, the precon, um, it's it's our aim, and and we we have been um, uh, uh, doing uh, similar precons before, and and the feedback was was always very very well. It was very um, uh, appreciated, um, uh, and, and so I. I am confident that you that you will learn the the coming the following items. Um, you will be able to better design and implement um, these these combined solutions where you have uh, hybrid tables, aggregations, um, that is query yes or no, maybe dual modes. Um, do you want to have um, um, yeah, well, that, that and, and also a big focus will be on the end-to-end -end orchestration of, of the things. Um, we will uh, get you the tools in hand to identify the performance bottlenecks, not, not only uh, what I just saw you about, uh, what I showed you about uh, the Vertipak analyzer, but also how can you make sure that your query uh, is folding? What does folding even mean? Um, and in the back end, how do you know? How do you know um, if, if queries are performance? How do you know? How can you monitor your end-to-end -end, um, uh, performance of, of your data pipelines? And you know all that considering, scaling doesn't only mean that it, it performs. It also needs to be a cost-efficient solution, of course. That's what we really mean with analytics at scale. We don't put it in the title uh, for a decent price. But that's what we are going to tell you, next, uh, teach you. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the detail about your pre-con that you're going to do. So with this, friends, we are we came to end of this particular training. You will receive a thank you email with the deck that Dave used to deliver this webinar. And it also received the information about the pre-con that Dave is going to deliver in September. And also the discount code we will be sending to you. And this recording also will be shared with you. Today's webinar recording also will be shared with you. And that information also will be sent across the thank you email that we're going to send next week. So with this, friends, we are done with today's webinar. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Dave, for taking out your time from your busy time and, uh, for, and delivering a free webinar for Data Platform Geeks community. Thank you.